You've had an opportunity during the course of this class to hear about lots of Kennedy tragedies. Well, this will be another one, and it will occur prior to the president's assassination. So we'll talk about another Kennedy tragedy. <coughs> Excuse me. On August 6th of 1963, August 6th of 1963, Jackie Kennedy felt a sharp pain while she was taking her children to riding lessons. On August 6, 1963, Jackie Kennedy felt a sharp pain in her abdomen area while she was taking her children to riding lessons. August 6, 1963, Jackie Kennedy feels a sharp pain in her abdomen region while she's taking her children to riding lessons. At this point, on August 6, 1963, Mrs. Kennedy was eight months pregnant. And as a result of those pains that she felt, a helicopter took her to the Children's Hospital in Boston. So Mrs. Kennedy feels a sharp pain on August 6, 1963 while taking her children to writing lessons. She is eight months pregnant at the time and as a result of those sharp, that sharp pain that she felt, a helicopter took her to the Children's Hospital in Boston. In other words, what was happening? Gonna have, well, not, not that sad. She was actually going to deliver early. Okay? And so when she got to the hospital, she tried like crazy to hold on on the birth until the president got there, but she went into labor prior to his arrival and gave birth to a son via C-section. So she tried like crazy to wait till the president got there. Unfortunately, nature didn't work that way and she gave birth to a son via C-section prior to the president arriving. The baby's name was Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. Obviously, the baby was born premature. He only weighed 4 pounds, 10 ounces at birth. 4 pounds, 10 ounces. So Mrs. Kennedy feels a sharp pain on August 6, 1963. She's eight months pregnant. The helicopter takes her to the Children's Hospital in Boston. She tries like crazy to hold on on the birth until the president can arrive. But she goes into labor and gives birth via C-section to a son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, who weighs 4 pounds, 10 ounces. Well, President Kennedy arrived at the hospital about 8 p.m. that night. And as he was in an elevator on his way up to his wife's room in the ICU unit, he was briefed by the doctor on the condition of both his wife and his son. So he arrives at 8 a.m., and he's briefed on the elevator in the elevator on his way up to see his wife in the ICU unit of the hospital by the doctor. He gives a report on both Jackie and the baby. The doctors report that Jackie was doing fairly well, but the newborn was in very grave condition because his lungs were very underdeveloped. So the president gets word that his wife appears to be doing fairly well. However, the young son, Patrick, is in grave condition because of premature lungs. Well, on the way to Jackie's room, President Kennedy happened to pass a room with two little girls who were both suffering from severe burns. So as the president is going towards his wife's room in the ICU, he notices a room with two little girls who are both suffering from severe burns. For reasons probably unknown only to the president, he stopped at that room and he stated to Secret Service agent Lawrence Newman that he wanted to write a note to each of the children. So as he's walking by this room that has two young girls who are both suffering from severe burns, the president stops at the room and he states to Secret Service agent Lawrence Newman that he would like to write a note to each of the children. So a nurse stand, that was standing by retrieved a piece of paper for the president. 
She gave him the names of the little girls, and the president took time to actually write a note to each of those little gals before he proceeded down the hall to see his son. So the president stopped, asked Secret, Ser Secret Service agent Lawrence Newman, told him he'd like to write a note to each of those little girls that were both suffering from severe burns. A nurse retrieved paper for the president, gave him the names of the girls, and he stopped and wrote a note to each of the girls and proceeded down the hall to see his son. His son Patrick died the next day of respiratory distress of the lungs due to the premature development of those at birth. Patrick died the next day of respiratory distress of the lungs. The reason they were so premature at birth. Now you gotta remember this was a long time ago when things were different. While Mrs. Kennedy was recuperating in the hospital, the president actually buried his son at the family plot in Brookline, Massachusetts. So as Mrs. Kennedy was recuperating from the ordeal, the president himself buried his son in the family plot in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. Now what was the Kennedy creed according to Joseph Kennedy Sr.? Kennedys don't cry. cry. And according to one of President Kennedy's closest aides, I would assume it would have either been David Powers or Kenneth O'Donnell, it was the first time in his life he had ever witnessed the president cry. First time ever. So historians state that one of President Kennedy's closest aides later stated it was the only time he had ever seen the president cry. Now, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy was later dug up, I guess for lack of a better term, and is buried with the president at Arlington Cemetery. You'll get a chance to see that. But another, another tragedy in the Kennedy family that occurred just prior to the assassination. Okay? Well, that'll take us to our next subtopic as we move into the assassination reasons why the president even went to Texas, and that was mending political fences in Texas. <coughs> mending political fences in Texas. Now, this is really important to understand why he even went there. What was his purpose to go there? Okay? Well... On September 26th of 1963, on September 26th of 1963, President Kennedy announced that he would take a trip to the state of Texas. It was on September 26th, 1963, that President Kennedy announced he would take a trip to the state of Texas. What was he thinking of? What was he thinking about that was coming up in 1964? This is the re-election. So he really is thinking of the upcoming presidential election in 1964. And he was going to take time out of his busy schedule in Washington to mend political fences in Texas. What do you think I mean by that? Mend political fences in Texas. How can a political fence? He's got to go mend the fence. Can he control the Republican Party in Texas? No. So what evidently is going on in Texas that he feels like he has to go there and mend fences? What's going on? Would he have to mend any fences if the Democratic Party was getting along just hunky-dory? No. What happened is you had a big struggle in Texas between the liberal wing of the Democratic Party and the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. And Texas was going to amount to 25 very important electoral votes at the time, and Kennedy needed to fix that struggle between the liberal and conservative wings, because if they don't get together and agree, he's going to lose Texas in 64 and 25 crucial electoral votes. Okay? Now, that wasn't even the biggest problem. Not only was there a struggle between the liberal and conservative wings of the Texas Democratic Party, the three most powerful powerful politicians in the state were involved in their own dispute. Okay? So the struggle was compounded by the fact that the three most powerful politicians, Democratic politicians in Texas, were involved in a dispute among themselves. Anybody know who the most important politician in Texas is? Vice President Lyndon Johnson. So he's involved in this dispute. The other two parties involved are the governor of Texas, John Connolly, 
and a Democratic senator from Texas, Ralph Yarber. So not only does Kennedy have troubles between the liberal and conservative wings of his own party in Texas, he also has the three most powerful politicians in the, within the Democratic Party involved in dispute. And the three most powerful politicians at the time were Vice President Lyndon Johnson, Texas Governor John Connolly, and Texas Senator Ralph Yarber. Here's a picture of John Connolly right here. Bob, and this is a picture of Ralph Yarborough. So Yarborough and Connolly and Vice President Lyndon Johnson are at odds. Now, it's kind of two against one here. It's Connolly and Johnson against Yarborough. It's Connolly and Johnson against Yarborough. And the reason that Connolly is disputing with Yarborough is because he's good friends with Johnson. So who is the conflict really between? Johnson. Vice President Johnson and Senator Ralph Yarborough. But because Governor Connolly was a good supporter and friend of Johnson, he kind of chipped in. What do you think would be Vice President Johnson's problem with a, former, a fellow Democratic Senator? Seems like they'd get along pretty good. They're from the same state. They're both Democrats. Well, the problem is this. During the 1960 presidential nomination process within the Democratic Party, who did Yarborough support for the nomination? No. No. Kennedy. He didn't support Johnson. Remember when they went through the process to try to nominate a candidate in 1960? Lyndon Johnson was a possibility. Stuart Symington, Hubert Humphrey, Adlai Stevenson. Well, Ralph Yarborough, who is a Democratic senator from Texas, Johnson expected his support for the nomination for president, and Yarborough supported Kennedy because they were different liberal conservative, right? Kennedy was considered a liberal Democrat, Johnson a conservative, okay? So, Senator Yarborough had angered Lyndon Johnson when he supported John Kennedy for the 1960 pres presidential nomination. Well, the, we, the thing that made it even tougher is that all three men, Governor Connolly, Senator Yarborough and Vice President Johnson are going to be up for re-election in 1964. And Yarborough was very paranoid that Johnson and Connolly were doing what? Campaigning against him. Okay, so it caused a rift within the Democratic Party. And Kennedy knew that this dispute between these three political giants in Texas would had to be stopped, or he had a chance, a good chance of losing those 25 electoral votes. So, Kennedy is going to Texas to mend political fences, but he's not going, out, going to announce publicly that's the reason he's going. He doesn't want people to know that. Yeah. He would be more liberal, yes. And Conley and Johnson were more conservative and Kennedy was liberal. And that's why Yarborough threw his support behind him. Was that LBJ? Well, no, loyalty is a big thing. I mean, you're from Texas, man. You support me because I'm from Texas. Now, so Kennedy, again, doesn't want the press or anybody else to know he's going to Texas to mend political fences. So what he does is he has Press Secretary Pierre Salinger announce that the president would be traveling to both Florida and Texas during the month of November 1963. So Press Secretary Pierre Salinger gives a press release and he said the President will be traveling to both Florida and Texas in November. And he was going there to inspect military installations in both states, in both Florida and Texas. Does he do that on this trip? Yes. But the real reason he's going is to get there and get Connolly, Johnson, and Yarborough on the same page. So Press Secretary Pierre Salinger announces publicly that President Kennedy would be traveling to both Florida and Texas during the month of November, and the President's agenda would include inspections of military installations in both Florida and Texas. Now, this is where you get the, the stage for Dallas. His tour of both Florida and, and Texas would include motorcade routes and speeches in five cities in each of the two states.
So his agenda is going to go to Florida with a motorcade route and then give a speech somewhere. Then another motorcade, give a speech somewhere. Five times in Florida, once in Texas. Now, you know what a motorcade route is because this sets the stage for what we're talking about. It's where they get off at the airport, off the airplane, the president's in his presidential limousine and he's got a motorcade. He's got people in front of him, back of him. It's a parade, like a motorcade. And they're going to go to different places in both states and give speeches. Okay? So let's talk about the Florida agenda first. What does the president do in Florida? Well, he goes to Florida in mid-November. And what he's really doing is he's beginning the business of campaigning for re-election. That's what he's really doing. So during that trip to Florida, he gave the speeches we talked about. We'll talk about one in particular. He also witnessed the firing of a Polaris missile from a nuclear submarine. They did a Polaris missile test off the coast of Florida. So during the trip, he's going to give this these speeches, he's going to be campaigning for re-election. He also witnessed the firing of a Polaris missile from a nuclear submarine. They did a little test for him because he is visiting military installations. And he also went to visit his ailing father who is in Palm Beach. They had a place in Palm Beach, Florida, still do, the Kennedy family. And so he goes to Florida in mid-November, he begins the business of campaigning for re-election in 1964. Also during the trip, he witnesses the firing of a Polaris missile from a nuclear submarine, visits his ailing father in Palm Beach. Probably the speech he gave in Florida that was most memorable happened on Monday, November 18th of 1963. Monday, November 18th. And he visited Tampa, Florida for this speech one of five he gave in the state. So on Monday, November 18, 1963, President Kennedy visited Tampa, Florida, and he gave a speech. Now, what did they give the president either before or after his speech? If you're speaking. What did, if you, you guys are going to pick a graduation speaker, I would hope you would know this. What were you going to do at the end of that person's speech, or maybe you'll do it before the person speaks? What's that? What? What are you going to do, though, to kind of thank them for coming? You're, well, you're going to give them a gift, hopefully, of some kind. When I went and spoke at my alma mater, Forsyth, they gave me a really nice painting when I left. So it was generally speaking that when the president spoke somewhere that he was given gifts either before or afterwards. During the speech in Tampa, they gave him a couple of gifts before he spoke. They gave him a humidor full of cigars, the mayor of Tampa gave him a humidor full of cigars. He was a cigar smoker. And so the mayor of Tampa gave him a humidor of cigars. What's a humidor? It's a box that keeps your cigars nice and fresh. <laughs> now, this is off the cuff, but a good friend of mine, Harry McCormick, has one of two humidors owned by President Kennedy. They're worth thou hundreds of thousands of dollars. He has one of two still available. He bought it from the Robert White collection, which came from the estate of Evelyn Lincoln, his personal secretary. Okay? You? I don't know. Now, the second thing he was given really wasn't for him. It was for his daughter, Caroline. The mayor's daughter gave the president a doll to give to his daughter, Caroline. So he really received two gifts. One was a humidor full of cigars from the mayor of Tampa, and then the mayor's daughter stood up and gave the president a doll for his daughter, Caroline. <clears throat> well, after his Florida agenda, the president came back to Washington, D.C. because he had a couple of chores he had to take care of before he then flew to Texas. Now, one of the chores that he had to take care of back in D.C. after the Florida agenda is he and Mrs. Kennedy entertained Supreme Court members and their wives at an annual function at the White House on November 20th. So after the Florida agenda, the President had to return to Washington, D.C. to take care of two key chores. The first being 
that the President and Mrs. Kennedy entertained Supreme Court justices and their spouses at an annual function. In other words, they did it every year, and it occurred on November 20th, 1963. Now, if anybody can guess the second thing he did, taking it in consideration the time of the year, I'll give you five points extra credit. The first person. Did I already say it? So, like, nine times before anybody. I get points. Oh. Well, he, we'll figure it out. Yeah, he pardoned the White House turkey. What happens every year, and they still do it today, is some poultry grower gets to be the one that gives the president the turkey for Thanksgiving. And they make a big deal of it. They bring it to the back yard of the White House, and they bring this bird in there that's flopping all around. And the president, who probably doesn't really want to eat the bird he's looking eye to eye with, pardons the turkey. The turkey is taken back to the farm and they bring another turkey that nobody sees for the present. But it's a big deal that the poultry grower that's chosen for that year is a big deal. Do the same thing now, okay? So those are the two things he did after he turned from Florida. Okay, now this is important to understand. There's a concern in Texas, okay? People are concerned about the president going to Texas. This is important. Now, you have to know this, and this is important. After it was announced by Pierre Salinger that the president was going to go to Texas, many of his aides, including O'Donnell and Powers, urged him, if you go to Texas, that's great, don't go to Dallas. Don't go to Dallas. And there were three specific reasons why Kennedy's aides wanted him to avoid a visit to Dallas. So there were some concerns about going to Texas. And his particular aides urged him not to go to the city of Dallas if he went to Texas. And there are three reasons why. Here's the first one. I